I would like to introduce Joy, who will continue on with the program. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much, Robin, for the introduction. My name is Joy. I'm a library associate here at the Michael E. Bush Annapolis Library. I'd like to present to you Scott Seligman. Scott is a national award-winning writer, an historian, a genealogist, and a former corporative executive who holds an undergraduate degree in American history from Princeton, and he also holds a master's degree from Harvard. He's now based in Washington, D.C., and he spent much of his career in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and China, and is fluent in Mandarin and reads and writes Chinese. He's worked as a legislative assistant to a member of the U.S. Congress. He's lobbied the Chinese government on behalf of American business, managed a multinational public relations agency in China, and he served as spokesperson for a Fortune 50 company and taught English and Chinese. And now, author of nine books, he is especially interested in the history of hyphenated Americans. His last work, The Great Kosher Meat War of 1902, won gold medals in the 2021 Independent Publisher Book Awards and the Reader's Views Literary Awards and was a finalist in the 2020 National Jewish Book Awards. Now, A Second Reckoning, the book that he'll be discussing today, has been named a finalist in four different national award competitions. And you can check out this book. A way that you can do it for free is by checking it out from the library if you go to aacpl.net and you search it in our catalog. And now I present to you Scott Seligman. Good evening. Well, that's how you can see the book for free, but you can also buy it if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I want to thank Joy and Robin um, and the library for setting this up uh, tonight. Um, I had very much wanted to speak about this book in Annapolis because really that's where it's set. And um, I'll talk for about 20, maybe 25 minutes tonight, and then I'd be very happy to take questions until, until you're tired of, um, uh, of asking them. But let me first share my screen here so I can show you the slides and um, make sure I did this right. I think that's the way to do it. Uh, am I good? Can you see the slides? Yes, Joy, yes. We're good? Okay, good. Um, Okay, um, well, let's get started. The, um, uh, let me start by talking um, for a minute about a book that I wrote right before the last book, which was the Kosher Meat book. Uh, this one was called The Third Degree. It was about a murder uh, here in, in Washington, DC um, that, um, that actually got me interested in, in the whole question of how minorities have historically been treated by the legal system. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so um, anything I write about the law is pretty accessible to lay people because uh, I don't understand all the terminology myself. Um, but I wrote about this book um, and John Snowden, who was the subject of the work I'm gonna talk about tonight, uh, doesn't appear in it, but it was published in 2018 and it bears a certain amount of similarity to his case. That book was about a Chinese uh, man named Jiang Sung Wan. Um, he was accused of murder here in Washington, DC. Um, he was abused by the police during his interrogation. He confessed, but only under duress, and he recanted at trial. And the issue of whether his confession should have been thrown out of court actually landed the case in the Supreme Court. Um, and the ruling was written by Justice Brandeis. Uh, and he, in that opinion, he set America on the road to what would eventually become, several decades later, the Miranda decision, uh, which we all know if we've ever watched uh, Law and Order or Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Well, John Snowden's case occurred at almost exactly the same time. Both of them involved minority defendants who were subjected to abusive treatment by the police. Both men were initially convicted, but one who actually initially confessed was eventually released, whereas John Snowden, who didn't ever confess, was hanged. So um, the story actually begins on, um, on uh, 2nd Street, which is today's Lafayette Avenue, if you know uh, Annapolis. Um, there were uh, two newlyweds, Valentine and Lottie Mae Brandon. They moved to Annapolis from Washington, D.C. because Valentine had a job at the Naval Experiment Station. And this is 1917. Um, Lottie Mae was pregnant. Uh, she wasn't working. Housing was actually very difficult to get because of World War I. Uh, but they managed to get this flat on 2nd Avenue, um, today's Lafayette Avenue. Uh, that building um, is um, right here. That building no longer exists. Um, but the parsonage of the Asbury Church, Asbury United Methodist Church is right next door to it. And that, that building is still there. So if you know that street, you know exactly where this thing took place. Well, on August 8th of that year, 
uh, Valentine returned from work. Um, he had to take the ferry over because he was um, in, the, in the middle of the Severn River. Uh, he returned from work. He found Lottie Mae motionless on their bed. He ran for help, but she was discovered to have been brutally murdered. Um, and the coroner um, uh, set the time of death at about midday. There were no suspects. The police first suspected Valentine, but he really had a pretty good alibi. Um, first of all, he'd been away all day and he could prove it. And secondly, Lottie Mae had been seen alive after he left from work for work. So uh, in order for him to have really been the, the, uh, the murderer, he would have had to come back by ferry and then go back to work by ferry. He would have been seen. So they interrogated him for several hours and they finally decided he probably wasn't guilty and they let him go. Well, in 1917, Annapolis had a police force but didn't have a detective bureau. And so they called in reinforcements from Baltimore, uh, which sent these three men, they were called the, the best third degree men in the country. Um, among them, they had sent a couple of dozen men to the gallows and many more to the penitentiary. Um, there they are, the, the pictures of the, the Lieutenant Doherty and Detectives Poehler and Kratz. And these guys went all over Annapolis questioning anybody they could find who might have any light whatsoever to shed on what had happened to Lottie Mae Brandon. Um, but after two or three days, they were still absolutely clueless. Uh, this was the headline. The murder case is still clothed in, mis in, in mystery. Um, and they were lost, but they admitted it. They said, that, you know, we, we're, we're nowhere. We don't know who did this. And then... Um, an, uh, and, uh, and, uh, a, 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 an article appeared in, um, in the Capitol. Oh, actually, this was in the Washington Times, but it was quoting uh, Emma Abbott Gage, who was the editor of the Capitol. Um, and um, she, she wrote about the case in the Capitol as well. But what she said to the Washington Times was the most interesting. She said, without a shred of evidence, she, uh, she concluded that the crime had been committed, committed, quote, evidently by a Negro. There was nothing evident about it. There were no clues, but she simply decided that um, it must have been a black person who had done the crime. Um, the the, uh, the capital was not all that friendly to African-Americans at that particular time in history, but this is you know more than, more than 100 years ago. Um, and this was Jim Crow, Maryland in action. Um, Philip Brown, who probably some of you have heard of, was a local activist who wrote a book in 1994 called The Other Annapolis. His quote uh, stood out for me. He said there were two groups of people living in one geographic area, but they were living altogether separate and different lives. In other words, you didn't need facts or evidence to assign blame across the color line. And Emma Abbott Gage had no facts and no evidence, but she decided that the criminal was probably black. So there we are. Well, okay, um, so um, this is a photograph of a uh, number 30 Lafayette Avenue, which is right across the street from the Brandon home. This is a modern photo that I took when I was in Annapolis. This house is still standing. And what's significant about it is, um, this was a house um, occupied by two sisters, uh, Edith Credit and Mary Perkins. They were black. They lived directly across the street from the Brandons. This actually surprised me when I started doing the research because Washington, D.C., where I live in 1917, was thoroughly segregated. And it surprised me that you have a narrow street in Annapolis where blacks and whites, in fact, are living side by side. And there were other blacks on the street as well, and other whites on the street as well. Um, and um, what I concluded was that Annapolis was just too small to be that segregated. Um, the uh, families interacted with each other. Um, and, the, um, and the Edith and Mary, Edith Credit and Mary Perkins, lived across the street from the Brandons, they knew them. And um, they came forward after several days. And they said that they had seen a man leave the Brandons home at around the time that the coroner believed that the murder had taken place. And they identified him as an ice man by the name of John Snowden. They said they had not come forward earlier because they were afraid they would start a race riot if they did. Um, and um, so uh, John Snowden was uh, very, actually they came forward in a, in a, in a, in a way, they, their mother was a, um, a laundress who worked for a woman, I didn't put a picture of her in the presentation, a woman named Ella Day Rush Murray, um, who employed their mother. Now Ella Murray lived in Acton Hall, which is the waterfront mansion on Acton Place, is still standing. And um, once, and, 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 uh, and their mother, um, uh, essentially asked if the two women could talk to, to, um, to her, to Ella Rush Murray. 
Uh, and they told the story and Ella Rushmore was the one that brought them to the police and said, tell the police the story that you just told me. So the police, uh, having heard the story, they immediately went out and arrested John Snowden. He didn't resist. He didn't even ask why he was being arrested. He just complied. And they brought him to the, to the, um, to the station house and they questioned him for about uh, three hours or so. Um, but, what they, but they didn't wanna keep him in Annapolis. Um, some of you may know the story in 1906 of a black man named Henry Davis, who was suspected of the attempted rape of a married white woman and he was dragged from the Anne Arundel County jailhouse to a vacant lot where he was strung up and shot to death by uh, white vigilantes. In the interim, since 1906, they had actually built a new, more fortified jailhouse with the idea that they would be able to stop things like lynchings. But the police didn't want to take any chances with John Snowden. They were afraid this was going to be a racially tainted case. And what they did was they transferred him to Baltimore. And in Baltimore, uh, John Snowden was interrogated incessantly, and I believe he was physically abused um, in order to extract the confession. But he maintained his innocence throughout, and he refused to confess. But even without a confession, the investigation turned out some pretty powerful circumstantial evidence against John Snowden. First of all, he lived on Acton Lane, which was right behind the Brandons. That's today, uh, that's called City Gate Lane today. In those days, it was Acton Lane, right behind the Brandons. And the woman that he lived with had uh, sometimes done uh, laundry for the Brandons. He had not gone to work on the day of the murder. He couldn't satisfactorily account for his actions that morning when the murder had taken place. He had been seen outside the house, as I said, by these two credible witnesses. Um, and while they were talking to him, he was caught in several inconsistencies during his interrogation. And also there were scratches on his face. And the autopsy, once the, an autopsy revealed that Lottie Mae Brandon had the skin of a black person under her fingernails, the police believed they had their man and they stopped looking for anybody else. Um, so if you don't know the story, the Reader's Digest version is that John Snowden was tried for the crime, he was convicted, his attorneys appealed, but the appellate court sustained the verdict. Um, his uh, attorneys went to, the, to call on the Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court in Washington, who declined to review the case. And then the only, uh, the only uh, chance for John Snowden at that point was the governor of Maryland. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm one slide behind. There's the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, uh, Edward Douglas White. And John Snowden's last hope was a man by the name of Emerson Columbus Harrington, who was the governor of Maryland between 1960 and 1920. And um, he was lobbied hard to um, either commute the sentence or pardon John Snowden. Um, but, and he was actually, interestingly enough, he was lobbied by whites and blacks alike. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But he ultimately refused clemency and John Snowden, um, he, so he wouldn't intervene and John Snowden was hanged for the crime. But that was not the end of the story. The Snowden case was regarded for most of the 20th century by many people in Annapolis, especially by the black community, as an example of what was called a legal lynching. Now, fast forward with me to the 1980s. And for some of you, I don't think I need to introduce Carl Snowden, or somebody who was an alderman um, here in, there in Annapolis. Um, Carl, um, actually, he also held positions with the state of Maryland and with Anne Arundel County. And when he was running for alderman in the early 1980s, um, Carl ran into John Snowden's brother, a man named Lewis Snowden. By the way, there's no relationship between Carl Snowden and, the, um, and, uh, and John Snowden, just, same, just the same surname. Um, he ran into Lewis Snowden and Lewis told him the story of John Snowden, his brother, and he was, it stayed with Carl. Carl said it was as alive for Lewis, um, who was already in his 80s at this point, as it had been probably back in 1917. He really felt that his brother had been denied justice. And he said, well, you're running for alderman. What are you going to do about my brother? And um, Carl listened to the story. He didn't need much persuading that um, John had been denied justice. Uh, he was a student of history himself. He was well aware of the indignities and, and the atrocities that Black people had suffered in, in Jim Crow, Maryland. But over a period of a decade, Carl decided, he petitioned actually two Maryland governors to reopen the case. Um, uh, William Donald Schaefer, who wasn't interested, and Paris Glendening, who referred it to his uh, pardon attorney. And actually, uh, Schaefer referred, to, referred it to the pardon attorney as well, but never did anything about it. Uh, Glendening did it as well. And um, 
uh, and uh, it was Glenn Denning who eventually granted John Snowden a posthumous pardon in the year 2001. Now, in reviewing the case, and, and fortunately for me, um, although some of the records are gone, much of the trial transcript actually survives. Thanks, uh, thanks to the uh, Maryland archives, I was able to read it. And I realized that there really wasn't any way that John Snowden's guilt or innocence could be proven conclusively a century after his trial. Um, even the Glenn Denning did not declare John Snowden innocent, although many people believe that he was, and many people believe that that's what the pardon meant. Pardons actually don't signal innocence or guilt. Um, so I, I, if, if I had had to, to prove, uh, and, and initially my thought was, if I can't prove this guy was innocent, why am I going to write this book? And so I walked away from it for a while. And then it kind of dawned on me that I was probably asking the wrong question. Because whether guilty or not, which couldn't really be determined a um, hundred years later, uh, there was another question there, which was, had he been treated fairly by the judicial system? Now, that was a question that I felt that I was in a position to ask and maybe even to answer. And so I, I, I forged ahead. Now, Maryland was not the Deep South. And um, uh, John Snowden's treatment in court was, it was certainly better than the one that was accorded to the Scottsboro Boys. You may have heard of that case. These were nine teenagers in Alabama who were infamously accused of the rape of, a, of two white women. Uh, it was 1931, I think was the year. They were never told they had a right to counsel. They were given no advance access to their attorneys. They were sentenced to death in rush trials that lasted one day. Now, none of that happened to John Snowden. He had a qualified attorney who fought hard for him, as far as anybody can tell. And on the surface of it, if you just look at the transcript, one might think that his treatment by the system was a fair one, but not if you study the details. The first thing was that John Snowden's trial began in Anne Arundel County. Um, and, um, but after 11 jurors had been impaneled, uh, the prosecution ran out of challenges. The way it worked in those days was that it was a murder trial. The, um, excuse me. Um, if it was a murder trial, the, um, the defense was uh, allowed an unlimited number of challenges to jurors, but the prosecution only got 10. And after they had impaneled 11 jurors, the prosecution was out of challenges which meant that the 12th juror would be essentially the choice of the defense with no input from the prosecution. And suddenly Nicholas Green, who was the prosecutor, suddenly he insisted without explaining it on a change in venue. And actually the trial was funded, was ultimately moved to Towson. Now I did some analysis of the jurors. Um, I got, this, was nine, this was close enough to 1920 that I compared their names with the 1920 census. Because in those days, when a jury pool was selected, they actually published the names of the jurors in the Capitol. So I knew who they were. I compared them to the records in the 1920 census. And one of the things that you could find in the census was the race of the person. And I came to the conclusion that the 11 people who were chosen were almost certainly all white. The names of those who were left in the jury pool uh, were never published. But if one of them had been black, the state's attorney could not have prevented him, and it had to be a him. Uh, women were not in, um, were not allowed on juries in Maryland until 1947. Um, the state's attorney could not have prevented him from being chosen, and the same is true if he had been a white person that the, um, uh, the the state's attorney had some reason to believe might be overly sympathetic to John Snowden. And there were a lot of white people in town that did not think this man was guilty. So rather than let a 12th juror be chosen essentially by the defense with no input, Green decided to roll the dice a second time. Now, interestingly enough, that would not have been against the law at the time. Um, if uh, it was still legal to keep a person off of a jury because of race uh, in 1917, 1918, and it would remain uh, so until 1986. But of course it would have been motivated by racial prejudice. We'd never do that today but it would not have technically been illegal. However, if there had been no blacks at all in the entire jury pool as a result of a deliberate effort to exclude them, which actually seems more likely, that would not only have been a product of racial bias, that would have been illegal. There was a Supreme Court case called Strouder versus West Virginia in 1880, 
that said that categorical exclusion of any race from jury pools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. Today, since, the, the, since 1986, both of those situations would have been unconstitutional, either keeping a group out of a, out of a jury pool entirely or refusing to choose a particular juror simply because of race. Both of those are unconstitutional today, but, they, but the, one of them was not uh, back in John Snowden's day. Well, it seems obvious in 2020 hindsight that what was going on was that the prosecution was shopping for a place where he could get an all white jury to try this black man. And that's exactly what he got in Towson. So that's the first thing that I think was, uh, was um, a real signal that maybe things weren't very fair. Another was John Snowden's treatment during his interrogation. The police of course denied that he had been mistreated and three officers got on the witness stand and denied that there had been any hanky panky in the way he'd been treated. But John Snowden insisted under oath that during the course of his various interrogations, and there were several of them, he was threatened, stripped, knocked down, forced to his knees, pummeled, struck over the head, made to drink whiskey to get him drunk, and actually had a loaded revolver pointed at him. Um, and later on, not specifically under oath, he told one of his cousins that they had actually uh, assaulted his genitals as well. I don't find any of that very difficult to believe, but if any of it were true, any of it, then nothing that he said during his interrogation should have been admitted by the court, but the judge ruled it all admissible. And it was quite damning for John Snowden because they could compare what he said during the, um, during the interrogation to what he said on the stand. And if there was a slightest uh, discrepancy, they could use it against him. There were also many instances when the judge ruled against the defense uh, that are highly questionable today. And there's the judge, his name was Frank Duncan. Um, for one thing, he did not permit the defense to impeach the credibility of those two black women who had accused John Snowden, uh, even though they had actually not come forward until a $500 cash reward had been offered. Um, the judge simply wouldn't allow it. He also permitted, uh, actually, uh, uh, he also permitted results of two autopsies to be introduced into evidence. Here's what happened. On the night of the murder, they did a kind of a slapdash autopsy in Annapolis to try to figure out what had caused Lottie Mae's death. Um, after that, she was um, uh, given over to an undertaker in Annapolis. Um, the next morning, she was transported by train to Washington, D.C. in the company of her husband, who, remember, had been a suspect. Uh, once they got to Washington, she was given to another undertaker to um, ready, her, uh, ready her up for burial, but not before the local police had fingerprinted her. Um, she was the next day transported to the Brandon home for the funeral services. She was then buried for several days, exhumed, and then they did another autopsy on her. And that was the autopsy where they discovered that the skin under her fingernails had belonged to an African-American. That was extremely damning. And they, uh, the um, defense fought like hell to keep the results of that second autopsy out of court, but the judge allowed it. He also allowed the prosecutor to make some uh, very prejudicial statements uh, during his summation. For example, he said, the Negro who ravishes a white woman deserves the extreme legal penalty and nothing short of it. That was wrong for all sorts of reasons. It was wrong because it was racist, but it was also wrong because he was asking the jury to send a message rather than to focus on the facts of the case, which was their job. I think that the case of John Snowden demonstrates that there are many ways that justice can be denied that are far more subtle, but just as nefarious as railroading hapless defendants through racist kangaroo courts, as happened to the Scottsboro boys. And then there was the governor, Emerson Columbus Harrington, who was in a position to commute the sentence or issue a part. He proclaimed himself loudly to be, quote, a friend of the colored race, end quote. But I got to tell you, the colored race could have done much better without friends like him. Um, he justified declining clemency to John Snowden because, and here's a quote, I had recently refused to commute to life imprisonment a colored man guilty of rape upon a colored girl. And so he said he could hardly do that for, quote, a Negro who has committed, in my opinion, both murder and rape upon a white woman. Now, why mention the races of the people if they weren't relevant? They were clearly extremely relevant to Harrington. So um, uh, his protestations to the contrary, there was the, what he did was laced with racism. Now, unlike Harrington, 
83 years later, Paris Glendening took no position on John Snowden's guilt or innocence, but he did conclude there was substantial evidence that he hadn't been granted a fair trial. And I wound up in more or less the same place, although I think I may have found more things to object to about the trial uh, than Glenn Denning did. I, I'm not sure because the, the official pardon file is actually missing in action. The archives doesn't have it and nobody knows where it is. Now, posthumous pardons do, and this is John's pardon right there. That's the, that's the whole, that, that's the original. Posthumous pardons do no demonstrable good to the dead. They're clearly all about the living. Usually relatives or friends of the deceased, uh, people like Hazel Snowden, who joined Carl Snowden in the effort to uh, secure a pardon for John Snowden. Um, so friends or relatives of the deceased usually are behind it, but sometimes they're spiritual or they're political heirs, or just people who were moved by their cases like Carl Snowden was and Janice Hayes Williams was. The pardons are most valuable when they redeem the living, of course. And you know, living prisoners should always go to the front of the line when you're talking about pardons because they, they can be much more valuable to somebody who's sitting behind bars. But if they're applied to the dead, they can also be extremely worthwhile because they can heal and they can send an affirmative message that the, the values of the past are discredited, they're no longer the values of the present, and it's a marker in the sand that says they must not be the values of the future. Um, so I think they're important for that reason. Now, John Snowden's was a state level case. The whole thing was adjudicated in Maryland. The Supreme Court never got involved in it. There was nothing federal about it. It was all within the state. But while I was doing the research, I checked on the Department of Justice's website here in Washington. And I discovered that when it comes to the level of federal crimes, that the Department of Justice refuses to accept applications for posthumous pardons. And I think that's wrong. And I think it needs to change. Um, the policy is grounded in the belief that the department has limited resources and they're better spent on the application of living people, which I, of course I don't argue with. Nobody should argue with that. Um, the Office of the Pardon Attorney has seven lawyers. They've got a backlog of about 2,500 petitions for pardons and about 12,000 more for some for other form of clemency. And there's no question that they need more resources if they're going to do their job and that living people should always take priority. But the U.S. government can multitask. And there can be great value in posthumous justice as well, in my mind. Um, the additional appropriations that they would need to address them would be lost in the rounding of the Justice Department's $28 billion budget. And um, I, I just think the government can walk and chew gum at the same time here. And given the paucity of posthumous pardons granted on all levels, by my count, there are only about 175 in the entire history of the United States, almost all of them done on the state level given the, the very small number, plus the fact that most criminal activity is adjudicated on the state level, there aren't that many federal crimes, um, that the additional burden on the, on the Justice Department would actually not be as great as I think they, uh, they, they, they say it would be. Now, I'm not advocating a systematic investigation of all potentially racially tainted cases in the history of the country. That would be an unmanageable task. Nobody could possibly get through that. The list would just be too long. But we can't let the extent of America's racially unjust past be an excuse to avoid revisiting any such cases. At the very least, cases in which evidence of bias survives and can be proven or can be shown, and there's a constituency for a second look. Here, some modern form of adjudication is not only desirable, I would argue it's imperative, and on both the state and the federal levels. Now, I did not write this book to advocate additional posthumous pardons for specific individuals. I didn't do enough research to know who I would recommend. But I, did, I can show you the, uh, the name of a few people where um, racial prejudice may well have played a role that other people have suggested might be good candidates for consideration. First one is Marcus Garvey, um, prominent black nationalist known for his role in the, the Back to Africa movement. He was targeted by J. Edgar Hoover for advocating civil rights. Uh, he was convicted of, conveniently of mail fraud in 1923, and he was deported to Jamaica, where he was from. Um, John Anthony Copeland, um, he was at the raid, um, the 1959 raid at Harper's Ferry alongside abolitionist uh, John Brown. He tried to lead a rebellion to end slavery, and he was hanged by the state of Virginia just for fighting for freedom. Leaders of major slave revolts or suspected conspiracies, Gabriel Prosser, Charles Deslandes, 
uh, Denmark Vizi, Nat Turner. Wait, I'm going too fast here. Whoa, Scott, sorry. Nat Turner, there we go. Um, and then there were two people called the Oberlin rescuers, Charles Langston and Simeon Bushnell, one black, one white. They were convicted in 1859 in a federal court for violating the Fugitive Slave Act by rescuing a man named John Price, who was an escaped slave um, from slave hunters. Uh, another one that was put forward is Geronimo. He was a Native American who fought white incursion into Apache land, and he spent the rest of his life after his arrest um, at hard labor as a prisoner of the US Army. Well, in recent years, we've seen statues of Confederate generals torn down. And we've seen new names given to high schools that had been named for slaveholders. And over the years, Americans have eliminated many egregious discriminatory policies that are imposed by the executive branches of national, state, and, and local governments. And they've repealed many racist laws, although we all know there's more to do there. But those are only two legs of the stool. A moral nation should also reckon with its judicial past, especially those cases in which prejudice is believed to have tainted verdicts um, uh, denied rights, uh, perverted procedures, whatever it is. And I think that historic miscarriages of justice must also be subject to a second look. Um, one way to think of it is instead of thinking of posthumous pardons in the same breath as we talk about pardons of living people, because they're really symbolic efforts, in a way they're more like tearing down a statue of a Confederate general or renaming a high school. And it doesn't take a great deal of effort for the government to do things like that. John Snowden was just as dead in 2001 as he was on the day of his hanging in 1919. And his pardon was, of course, important to his family, which believed in his innocence, and more broadly um, to Annapolis, and to, especially to the Annapolis Black community, which in the main, as I said, viewed his execution as a miscarriage of justice. And after the pardon was issued, um, which was a meaningful statement to the entire country, um, Governor Glendening was honored at uh, Asbury Church in 2001 for what he had done for John Snowden, but also some of the other things that he had done um, to, for minority rights generally. His quote in the John Snowden, uh, in the news release that accompanied the John Snowden pardon stayed with me. He said, the search for justice has no statute of limitations. And uh, it stayed with me because I think, it's a, I think it's very apt and very accurate. Now, Hazel Snowden was John's niece. She was the daughter of Lewis Snowden, John's brother, the same one that met Carl Snowden uh, in the 80s. Hazel, um, once she found out about Carl's um, efforts, she wrote letters, she phoned the parole board, she wrote personal letter to the governor. And um, the evening that the pardon was issued, she visited his grave at Brewer Hill Cemetery to pray for his soul and to weep for him. Hazel is convinced that it was her letter that, uh, that, that pushed the governor over. Every year since that time, on or near John Snowden's birthday, his niece has held a cookout in her uncle's honor. Friends, relatives, and people who helped secure the pardon are all invited to celebrate John Snowden's life. It, it's a happy occasion, but it has its somber moments. Somebody is asked to read the text of the pardon out loud, and somebody else recites John Snowden's last statement, which was an extremely moving one. Anybody who dismisses the value of posthumous pardons simply because the defendants are dead would do well to attend one of Hazel Snowden's barbecues. I was honored to attend one a couple of years ago before COVID. For me, they are eloquent testimony to the significance that acts like this can have for people who are very much alive today. Well, um, now let me stop here um, and unshare the screen. And I would be um, very happy to take um, questions. Wait a minute, I thought I unshared the screen, did I? Yes, yeah, yes you did. Unshared. Good. Technology is not entirely cooperating today. No, that's all right. But thank you so, so much for that presentation and for all of that information. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to put in the chat or they'd like to say out loud while we're still recording? Okay, well, I had one. So some people would ask, and some people have asked us while they knew that we were preparing for this program, why talk about these things today? And that's really what your whole presentation, your presentation, your book is about. It's not so, it's about, of course, the history, but it's also about today and what posthumous pardons, for example, do today, but also just talking about 
trials such as these and cases like this and how racism looked then and how it looks now, why do you think it's so important to talk about these things today? And also, I wanted to highlight what you say in the preface, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but you say that reevaluating our collective history, reevaluating and reinterpreting American history is as American as anything. Sure. I mean, when I was when I grew up in the 50s and 60s, American history was the history of a lot of old white guys. And, um, and you know, today, uh, uh, and, and that's what I said, I think one of my interests is basically sort of hyphenated Americans, just for, for want of a better term, uh, how minorities have been treated. And minorities are part of the part of the history, too. I've actually written four books on early Chinese Americans, one on early Jewish Americans. This is my first on early African Americans. So um, in order to get a, you know, a, a picture of what really was going on, you have got to look at something other than a bunch of white guys debating each other in Congress. Um, uh, the, um, but the significance of it, I think, I, I mean, I more or less talked about the significance of it in the talk. Um, these are historic wrongs. Um, and the symbolism of, this, of, of us uh, admitting as a nation or as a state that some wrong, a wrong was done to someone is in some ways to uh, repent for it and to set and, and to put a marker in the sand that says, no, we're never going to do this again. Um, so like I say, you know, it doesn't, Johnson is just as dead today as he was when he was, when he was hanged, but um, uh, people who were interested in his case got a message when Governor Glendening pardoned him. Hmm. And the message was, there's no statute of limitations on justice. And that if we believe what we say we believe, if these are our, our values as a people, then we have an obligation to look back. Um, just like we're repealing bad laws, um, we should look at some of the bad decisions that courts have given us. And where we can and where it's possible to reconstruct, um, I think we should be trying to right the wrongs. Absolutely. Thank you. And I see someone in the chat said, thanks for the great talk. What was the most challenging part about researching this book? Hmm. Um, well, trying to pull all the materials together. Um, I used, first of all, the uh, Maryland National, Maryland State Archives, God bless them. They have a lot of the materials from the John Snowden case actually online and available if you want to search for them, including the, tri the trial transcript uh, or a good chunk of the trial transcript. The, the, uh, uh, transcripts don't tend to continue to exist for individual trials from that far back. But if there was an appeal, which there was in the case of John Snowden, they had to present chunks of the, of the actual verbatim trial um, to the appellate court. And so they had to record them and they had to print them. And, um, and that's why these things still exist. The most challenging thing and the most disappointing thing was that the actual um, uh, dossier that the pardon attorney prepared for Governor Glendening is missing in action. The archives looked under rocks for it. They called people in the state to see if anybody knew what had happened to it. It ought to have been given over to the Maryland archives together with the papers from the Glendening administration and they can't find it. And that made me do, unfortunately I had to do a little bit of guesswork as to what they probably had found out when they reviewed it. Um, I, I never really was able to do that. And I don't know exactly what Glendening was told before he um, made his decision. I do know what he thought because he put it in a press release. So I, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, um, uh, uh, it wasn't too difficult to figure out what probably had been in the dossier, but that was really a problem. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that most of my work, in fact, almost all of my work um, is, his, is old enough in history that there's nobody alive today to talk to about it. I mean, this thing happened in 1917. Um, there was nobody around who remembers John Snowden's hanging. But this one was different because there was a whole section of this book that took place in the 21st century. And so I found myself in the unaccustomed position of having to interview living people. I would stay away from living people because they can tell you you're wrong. Um, but, um, you know, in this case, um, I interviewed Carl, I interviewed Hazel, I interviewed Janice, and um, several people who remembered this and had some things to tell me about how it had uh, played out. And that was, that was, the, that was the good part. Thank you, thank you for that. And then they also ask, also, why did the sisters on Second Street go to the police to say it was Snowden? Okay, well, they didn't initially. They, they had figured out it was Snowden and he was the guy that all of Annapolis was looking for for three days. Um, the, um, 
they didn't go to the police. They went to Ella Rush Murray uh, up at um, in Acton Hall where their mother worked. And they, because they, they knew they had knowledge of something that all of Annapolis was looking for, but they were worried about going forward because first of all, it was a black man and they were afraid of a race riot. Um, and as it turned out, um, they were kind of shunned by the black community after they came forward because they had accused a black man. Ellen Murray took them right to the police and said, tell the police what you told me, which they did. And uh, John Snowden was fingered and you know the rest of that story. But um, before he was hanged, while he was while they were trying to petition the governor um, for clemency for him, Ella, Mush Ella Murray had a change of heart and she came to believe that he was innocent and she was devastated that she had played a role in accusing him. In fact, she spoke at his funeral. The, um, I, I should tell you a little bit more about the uh, lobbying the governor. Um, the governor himself um, was, a, he probably met with five or six groups to talk about the, um, the, the Snowden case. A couple of them were all black, a couple of them were white. And the last one that he met was a huge group of people that had assembled. It was very close to the execution. And it was whites and blacks together. And the blacks didn't say anything at the meeting. They figured at that point they'd said their piece and that if anything was gonna save John Snowden, it was other white people um, lobbying the governor. And um, there was, um, after John Snowden was, uh, uh, was hanged uh, and they scheduled the funeral, they made it very, very clear that even though it was a black church, that white people were very welcome. They, they, there was almost a feeling that they had a debt to pay to some of the white people who had stood up for John Snowden. Um, this was unlike a lot of other cases that you read about, this was not polarized according to race. There were a lot of whites that really believed he was innocent. Um, and, uh, and they came forward and, they, and a lot of them were, were um, uh, you know, big men on campus in, uh, in, in, uh, in Annapolis, businessmen, important people that really pushed the governor on this. Uh, Ella Murray spoke at the funeral and she talked about how devastated she was to have played a role in it. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a very important, I think, a, kind of a healing moment for everybody. I did have one other question for you. Mm -hmm. And then of course, please continue to put your questions in the chat or if you want to unmute while we're still recording. But I did want to ask you this while we still have it on film. Okay. I really appreciated the style of your writing for this book because a lot of people, this being all facts and all true things, people would expect it to sound like a history book, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Yeah. But it reads like a novel. Okay. Is that Thank how you, you write that. all of your books? Uh, well. Um... Uh, I try to. It's called narrative nonfiction. It's supposed mm -hmm. to be. Uh, it's supposed to read like a novel, but not. There should not be a word of it that's not true and demonstrable. I'm. A, I. Uh, I don't allow liberties. Some of the. Some people write narrative nonfiction. Will use their imagination. They'll invent dialogue that wasn't actually spoken, but they think the person might have said something like it, um, or so and so must have been thinking this and that kind of thing. I don't do that. If I don't have a source, I don't use it. Um, the beauty of this was that some of the trial transcripts, there were verbatims in these trial transcripts. So you actually had dialogue that you could import into the book, which really makes it much more like a novel than like a dry history. And if you're writing narrative nonfiction, you know, you salivate when you see something like that, because mm -hmm. you know it's really gonna help your chapter become be more interesting. But, uh, but thank you, Joe, I take that as a real compliment. Absolutely, yes, thank you. All right, my computer is about to be restart. I'm going to be very honest with you guys right now. So Robin, I'm going to have you take over and I'm going to switch computers. <laughs> yes, um, technology. Our technology has perfect timing at all times, <laughs> absolutely. So um, I do wanna make sure and that nobody else has any more questions. Um, you could either ask them in person or put them in chat. And we can wait a few minutes. And if we don't have anything else, we'll go ahead and stop the recording and give people a few minutes if there's something they want to ask you off film. So it was a very, do you have anything that you would like to say? Scott? Yeah, Robin, I realized that I didn't complete my answer on the why the sisters went to, to oh, the okay. police. Uh, I'm reading it now and I realized I didn't go far enough in it. Um, the accusation that the defense made was that the sisters only came forward when a $500 reward was offered. And, um, and they should have been allowed to argue that, and they weren't. As a practical matter, the governor 
one of those women had worked in the executive mansion and the governor knew her and thought that she had um, that she was an honest person. So that's one of the, 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 the factors. But also the governor made a statement uh, before, uh, before he uh, decided not to pardon Snowden that the women had actually not come forward and claimed the money. And they were more or less driven out of town. They were excoriated because they had they ratted on another on a fellow black man in the black community. And as far as I know, both of them left town after that. And I was not able to find descendants. I looked pretty hard. I was not able to find descendants of these women. Hmm. Interesting. All right. Anybody else have anything else? Anything? I see Joy is trying to get back on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure she has any more questions she wanted to ask, so I will wait. Nope, you're good. All right. I am going. So thank you for this. Is We are going to end the recorded part and um, like people have a few minutes to um, ask if they want to ask any questions off the camera. And um, then we can conclude the program after that. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Hold on. I'm going to stop the recording.